Okay, we're back for part two out of three in this video series about the RC industry. In part one, which you can see right here, we spoke about the problems we face as an industry and potential solutions for that. We started off by talking about how we need to promote RC racing better. We need to be more welcoming for new people and also we need to make racing more convenient and fun. Today we're going to talk about different kinds of races. So from club racing to all the way to world championship level racing. What's the difference between all these kind of different races and what are their purpose? Because they, they each serve a different purpose. So we're going to talk about that. But first, check this out. An actual book. All about RC car setup. So some basic stuff about building, maintenance, and then after that, deep dive into car setup. Hopefully everything you need to know in here. So it's 120 pages long. Check out invisiblespeed.net. Oh, and this book, it's written in a way that it should be suitable for anyone, really. If you're a beginner and you enjoy, you know, trying different setups and stuff, but you don't really know much at all, get this book and you'll, you'll learn. If you're uh, already a established racer, raced for a long time, you can still uh, learn something from this book. So no matter what your skill level and knowledge level, this book should be good for you. And also for different classes. Okay, I've written it focusing on eight scale nitro off-road, but it works for 10 scale off-road too. And I'm sure even on-road drivers would find something of interest in the book. So don't be shy, order yours today. Okay, so before we go into today's main topic, I need to address the elephant in the room because we all know we have a big problem in the industry where everyone's sponsored. Everyone is a team driver. I have 50% off, 65 off, 75% off. Everyone, it's basically like a contract customer. A brand signs a contract with a customer that gets a discount. But people see that as sponsorship, like I'm sponsored, I'm on a team. They run all the logos on their shirts and cars and they're on the team. Okay, why is this a problem? Well, it's a bit of a problem because often that means that you're going direct to the manufacturer or the distributor. You aren't going through the local hobby shop. So the hobby shop loses a lot of sales because of this, you know, tires, engines, servos, car kits, spare parts, because now the drivers who go to the local track where the local hobby shop is, they aren't buying from the shop. They're buying because they're team drivers now from the manufacturers or the distributors. So this is why it's a bit of a problem. So why did this happen then? This happened about say 15, 20 years ago when the companies, the manufacturers in Taiwan and China, they changed the way they do business. So they began manufacturing for, well, Pretty much anyone. I mean, look at me, even for me, they started manufacturing for people and companies who wanted to create their own brands. So instead of there just being a few brands, like five car brands, for example, suddenly we had 30 car brands or engine brands, same thing, uh, tires, all kinds of different brands where we used to have a few, suddenly we had many. Now the problem was that the market didn't grow at the same time. So Instead of having the few brands, we now had many, but the market was the same size. So everyone's piece of the pie got smaller. This is compounded by a few other issues. So for example, production costs have been going up because salaries in China, for example, have been going up. So because of that, the manufacturing costs are going up. Also, because there were so many brands now and not enough hobby shops for all the brands, to make it, these brands had to start selling direct. Now, why would someone decide to run for some obscure new brand? Often they did it because they got a discount. So then, then this, is, this became sort of a race to the bottom. So everyone's starting giving discounts to be able to sell more. And suddenly 
if you wanted to sell cars, you had to give discounts because what people would do is they would go to brand A, ask for a discount, they didn't get it. They went to brand B, brand C, brand D. Eventually they would get a discount somewhere and that's what they would run. And that's basically where we are today. Actually, fun side note, you can actually get sponsored even if you don't exist. So you can make up a person, trust me on this one, you can make up a person and create a resume, send out the resume and you can get a discount. So you can invent a person and get that invented person sponsored. That's how bad this is. Trust me on this. Another unfortunate side effect of this has been that innovation has sort of ceased now because there just isn't the financial benefit in creating something revolutionary and something different. So you spend all that time and money in trying to figure something new out. You create a new kind of product or new design, and then you don't reap the benefits of that because very soon after that, seven other brands have the same thing. Or even if no one does the same thing, your, your sales are just too small to justify that upfront cost. So back in the day when there were fewer brands and they had larger sales, we saw more innovation and faster innovation because it, financially it made sense. There's one more thing that's going on in the RC industry today, which makes it maybe seem better than it actually is. And that's the fact that there's a number of sort of uh, wealthy individuals who have come in and started their own brands or, or companies in RC. And it's sort of a hobby for them. And if not that, then maybe also there are some companies that as a side business, so they have a main business and then for, you know, tax planning reasons, or just because they love RC racing, they start a business in RC also. So they invest money from their other business into this. And it makes it look like RC is doing better than it actually is because these companies are bringing in money from elsewhere so they can hire a lot of drivers. It looks like they're a big brand, but they're actually giving a lot of cars away. They're selling a lot of cars for very low margins. They're doing things that a brand in RC that's relying on income from RC racing only can't really do. So that means that maybe some people looking at the market, looking at the amount of professional drivers, paid drivers, they think, oh, every, everything's great, but not really. Because if you took those companies away, they would be top drivers right now with no paid rides. I'm sure of it. And some people don't like this. Other think, people think it's good. I think it's a mix of both. Of course, it's hard for the RC only companies to compete with companies like this. But on the other hand, when these companies who are bringing money in are doing it right and they're investing in races, sponsoring events, uh, tracks, and also, I mean, paying staff, mechanics, drivers and such, I think it's a good thing. So as long as there's enough sales for everyone to stick around, I think it's good. The more investment we have in RC, the better. So anyway, what's my point? My point is that this is happening, but we changing it isn't really an option. We can't limit the number of drivers that a company can sponsor. That's not going to work. We can't change the fact that now people shop around until they get a deal, a discount. This is just, we have to accept this. This is how the industry is. This is how the market is. I think a solution for this is really to grow the market. That's the only way, because this is what we have now. We can't change it. We need more customers. So we need more people in RC racing. So now we're going to look at how we can do that. So racing, all about racing. First, I think just an overview. So if you haven't raced anywhere else than your home country, you might not realize that there's sort of a difference in racing culture around the world. This is how I would break it down. So in Asia and also, you know, South, South and Central America, the races tend to be a bit different than Europe and America. And I think that the reason is that in those countries, you have to be sort of upper class or wealthier, richer to race. 
So it's not something your average Joe will be doing as a hobby. It's more like when we look at Asian countries like Indonesia or Philippines, the people who race RC cars typically are, you know, CEOs, owners of businesses, you know, directors, sort of a higher paying job. So for them, it's like golf for someone in Europe or America, maybe. They go to the RC race with a different mindset. It's all just about maximizing fun. So the races are focused on a lot of track time and a fun time. And in the evenings, they get together often and there's all kinds of, you know, dinners and banquets and things. So it's more, more of an event. And that's why I think the races in Asia are super fun. And another thing, often that the facilities and the organization is on point. And that's, again, because labor is so cheap there. So, uh, for example, no marshalling. Often the, they will have paid marshals. So that's great. Then in Europe, I think that the races are a bit more serious in a way. Like people approach it more as competition and I want to do as well as possible. So the focus is more on sort of a structured, well-run event that's fair. We follow the rules and then at the end we have a winner. So th that's how European races tend to be. It's still fun. It's still pretty laid back. You know, in Southern Europe, there's, they have food and beer at the races. And, and it's a good time. Don't get me wrong. It's just a bit different. It's sort of more structured. And let's make sure we follow the rules. And uh, it's very sort of professional in a sense. One thing that Europe lacks, I think, compared to Asia and also especially to America is club racing culture. So we don't tend to have many and good club races, really. S yes, some regions have more than others, but if I sort of generalize about what I have experienced traveling around Europe, it is that it's more always either a national race or a regional race, but something bigger always. It's not this sort of let's go to the track on a Wednesday evening and race or a Saturday afternoon club race like that doesn't really happen as much, which is a shame. But maybe that's because the tracks in Europe are normally run by clubs. So it's volunteers doing it. And yeah, maybe it just gets to be too much if you have to have a couple of club races every week. So that's then we go to America. The way the racing works in America is it's all about the money. It's business. The tracks are businesses and they need to make money, which is good. But then the racing also suffers because of it. So the club racing scene is good because tracks need, need an income. So they run club races. You can race. If you go to California, for example, you can basically race five days a week, maybe six. Because you, if you go between indoor 10 scale and outdoor 8 scale. Because they race club races during the week and on weekends. So it's really good. But then when we start moving into the bigger races, what happens is the focus is on money and entries. So the organizer just wants to make as much money as possible. And the way I see it is it's basically what can we get away with? So we want to maximize the number of entries and the money we can make. And then we make the race just good enough to where people show up. Seriously, that's how, that's how I feel it is. So if we look at big races around the world, Asia has the best, then Europe and America is last, unfortunately. I'm sorry, guys. I'm just being honest. But if we look at club racing and sort of smaller, sort of not look at the big stuff, just if you just stay locally in your area and you just enjoy racing with your friends what's the best place to be i think definitely america because there you have practice nights practice days and then you can club race too where europe we don't have that much asia yes but it's not the same as america nowhere near to it so that's the different racing cultures around the world now they all have good sides and bad sides so i think that the best possible scenario would be if we could take the Asian atmosphere, the sort of fun, 
event atmosphere from the races in Asia. Then we would have the structure and the schedule, the professionalism of Europe. And then we would add the club racing culture of America, plus the sort of really high level of track design and also competition that they have in America. If we could sort of mold all of that together, whoops, mold all of that together, we would have the perfect race. So let's go into the different kinds of racing. This applies to all of the world, basically. We have different kinds of races and they all serve a different purpose. So first we have club races. Then we have local and regional races, national races and national championship races, and these sort of big travel races. So races in a country where people travel to, sometimes even internationally, but mostly just people from that country travel to this race. And then finally, we have international races like world championships, European championships, the Neo race back in the day, those kind of big events. So these are four different kinds of races, and I would argue they all serve a slightly different purpose. And because of that, they should also be run differently. And that maybe they should use different formats. So let's get into that now. So first of all, let's talk about club racing. Okay, so the point of club racing is to make it easy for new people to enter the hobby, to start racing. So we need to make it fun and easy for those people. And also for the locals, just maintain the enjoyment of the hobby. So race on a weekly basis and just keep it fun. That's really what we should focus on when it comes to club racing. So a friendly, fun environment where people can learn, race and enjoy themselves. All levels of people. And an extra focus on new people. So maybe include a class for where you can race any car. Just bring what you have. Whatever vehicle you have, put it on the track and you can race. You know, a novice class, anything goes. This is where the rules matter the least because it's club racing. This is where we all start. So it should just be as fun as possible. And of course, learn the ropes so you can then progress to bigger races. So club racing is really where you could have the most classes, skill levels, different kind of cars, you know, just a relaxed atmosphere and race. This is also where you can do something different. So I want to show you something that uh, they do here in Finland at my local track. And this has to do with the club racing. Like I said, it's good to have, you know, a class for complete beginners. But this is something else that could be considered for club racing. So it's called Rally Koulu. So Rally School. Oh, nice car in the banner, by the way. Uh, anyway, so what this is, it's a program that's run for children. So an attempt to get children into RC racing. And now because of COVID, they haven't been doing it. But the idea is that the club has a bunch of cars and uh, you pay an entry fee. And let's see, they had a schedule down here. You pay an entry fee and then they have a course basically over the winter and the spring. So Fridays and Saturdays and a Sunday here, apparently. And the parents can bring the kids there and then they have a program of, you know, practice and different kind of games they play and learning to drive. And eventually then a number of these children took up racing. But my point now is just to say that for club racing and uh, local racing like this, it makes sense to have something to make it easier for new people to join. And the club race is the per perfect time to introduce people to racing. So keep that in mind. We can sort of bend the rules and change the formats and make uh, RC more accessible for kids and new people in general. And the club race is the right place to do that. Uh, we're going to talk more about this in detail next week when we talk about federations and what federations should be doing. But I just wanted to bring this up to highlight the fact that we don't need to be so strict with the way we run our races, you know. At the club race, maybe experiment and innovate a bit and think of ways to get new people into the hobby and hooked into racing. 
Okay, so that's club racing for you. After club racing, then we have sort of regional racing for slight... Uh. So after club racing, we have regional races, which is one step up from club racing. So these races, they're a bit more serious and of a higher level. So that organization needs to be, you know, a bit more on point. And also typically maybe there's more drivers and a higher level of drivers. Uh, people travel from further to these events. So as an organizer, you also need to sort of invest more in the race itself to make it worth their time. So it needs to be sort of one step more structured, controlled, and uh, less classes and more value for money. It's more about racing instead of learning like at a club race, but it's still fun and relaxed. And it's still all about welcoming new people and helping people and having fun at the track racing. So I think these two categories, club racing and regional racing, this is pretty straightforward. It's just, if you just remember that, okay, we need to make sure that this is where new people come in we need to make this accessible, convenient, easy for people, and we need to focus on fun. And we should have classes also for complete beginners so they feel welcome and s start racing. So this is quite straightforward. I think the only thing to remember here is in areas where these races tend to grow a lot. So you have club races with, you know, 100 plus entries and the days, day can be really long. It could make sense to stagger the classes. Now, what I mean with that is one problem we have in the hobby is that to race, you have to spend so much time at the track. And not all people, especially in this day and age, can spend all day at the track. As, as much, much track, track time, time in, in as, as little, little bit of our day wait. as possible. As, as much track, track time in, in as, as little, little bit, bit of, of our, our day as possible. possible. As, as much track, track time in, in, in as, as little, little bit of our day as possible. As, as much track time in as little bit of our day as possible. As much track time in as little bit of a day as possible. As much track time in as little bit of our day as possible. As much track time in as little bit of our day as possible. As much track time in, in as, as little, little bit of our day, day as, possible. as possible. Nailed it! So a good idea could be that, let's say you have some sort of novice class or junior class or stock class, maybe make that so it runs in the morning. You know, it runs in the morning until noon, for example. Or something like that, where you don't have to be there all day. So you could even have three different parts of the day. You have morning, day, and then night, evening. And you run different classes in those segments. That means that if you run a class at night, you don't have to be there early in the morning. You can do other stuff in the morning or daytime and then just get there in the afternoon and then do your race and then leave. Or if you pick classes appro appropriately, you can spend all day at the track, race all day, a different class in each section. But by doing this, you ensure that more people are able to start racing and race consistently because they can work around their schedule of taking their kids to soccer practice or whatever they have to do. So let's not force people to spend all day at the track. Let's be clever about it. Let's stagger the racing classes so people can choose when they want to race. I think that would make uh, a lot of sense. So not just all skill level uh, classes uh, like all beginner classes in the morning for example or all pro classes in the evening no not like that but rather sort of eight scale nitro buggy in the evening or morning for example and truggy at, at another time and eight scale e-buggy at another time but then all skill classes that means that you can either race all day or just pick a class and race at a certain time regardless of what your skill level is. So these kind of ideas actually, so for example, how to do this, how do you stagger the classes to come up with a schedule for that and a plan for how to do it. Uh, we'll talk about this more in the third video also, because I think this is something that federations should do. Okay, so now we get to the races, which I always complain about. I'm always ranting and raving about these races, mostly about the ones in America, because like I said, the big races in Asia are amazing. 
it's all about the racer. The Asian big events, these things don't really apply. Most of these things don't apply to them. America is the worst offender for these things. And Europe is pretty good, actually. Europe, normally there's only one class and there's a lot of track time. So this doesn't also uh, apply as much for the European races. So it looks like I'm singling out the Americans here, but it needs to be said. So the, so the big national and international events, these are the most important and prestigious races that anyone can attend. For world championships, for example, European championships, just anyone can't show up. You know, you have to qualify through your country and then if you get a spot, you can go. So not everyone can go. But these big races, anyone can go up, go there. Anyone can sign up to the Dirt Nitro Challenge or Silver State or the Neo Buggy race when that was still going on. Like anyone could go. Yet it was a big race and most of the world's best drivers went there. So these races... They, they, they are of a high level, people care about them, people spend money and travel to them, so the organizer has to provide more value than at the club race or the regional race. So more value means a schedule, a structure, a fair race where everyone gets the same amount of track time, practice, qualifying, finals. You know, of course, finals are different lengths, but you see what I mean? Like, you can't just let people practice randomly so some people get more practice than others you know you can't do that you can't have a big race like this and have international drivers show up and there's no electricity no power no pit tables no chairs no place to clean the car you know there's just sort of random practice you stand in line and there's no no nothing it's like what is that you need to organize it you need to have a schedule so you know when you drive. It's ridiculous that you show up in the morning and you don't exactly know when you're going to drive. Then you drive once and you don't know when the next heat will be. It could be three hours, could be five. You don't know. That's no good. You know, so as an organizer, if you want to organize a big event and you want people to travel to it, you should provide value. You should make an effort as an organizer too. You can still make money, but pay some back to the racer by paying attention and making the race good. JQ, thanks for having me back. This should be interesting though, because uh, we actually haven't talked about this topic over the phone or anything prior. So this will be your first time hearing my thoughts on this subject. So I hope you like it and it makes the video. Hey guys, Ryan again, and I think JQ, he wanted me to touch base and share some thoughts on our current race event structure or the environment. And particularly, I wanted to take a moment and talk about the pressure that I feel a lot of your local or average level racers will feel. And I think it's incredibly unnecessary and somewhat negatively impacting our hobby. Allow me to elaborate. There's a lot of layers to this and things that are impacting why racers might want to go to all of these big race events all the time. The problem with this, and I'm speaking from personal experience, is that there's a lot of races that I would probably like to go to, but I opt out and I don't go because of the huge time and financial commitment required to do those things. So in a very simple number sense, if you have the financial means to responsibly go and enjoy all those races at your own expense, literally, and it doesn't put you in a financial detriment, then go for it, have fun. But for everyone else, myself included, there's a lot of pressure to go to all these races and then kind of put yourself into this really interesting relationship with the hobby that you got in just to love and casually do. And now you found yourself, it became, starts to feel like a job and it's a lot of work and a lot of money and you enjoy it still sometimes, but maybe you're not really sure. <laughs> One of the big things, let me share a statistic that I'm not necessarily happy is a fact about my life, but over the past at least two years, 100% of my PTO time was used to attend races. The 
Thursday, Friday, before a weekend, Monday, Tuesday, after whatever that case is or particular event, it was used for flight time or travel time, driving time. And none of it was used for my own break from work or to enjoy time with my wife or family, friends, etc. Some stuff that should definitely be used. And I kind of got to a point where it's like, you know what, that's not right. You shouldn't jeopardize and hold hostage all the other things that are important in your life just so that you can constantly go to all of these toy car races. It's just not right. I understand maybe slightly subjective and people are in different circumstances and they can do it a little, little bit higher frequency than someone like myself. So I may be speaking to you, I may not. Something that I would like to see is that you find a way to condense the time required to attend these big fun races. Simply put, to show up on a Wednesday night, practice Thursday, Friday, qualifying Saturday, Sunday, drive home Monday, and if it's this kind of process over and over and over again, and for most of them, you're there from the moment the track opens until they kick everybody out at night. It's a 14, 18 hour day in some scenarios for four days in a row. It's not fun. It's a lot of work. It's competitive. And in the end, you may get some sort of sense of accomplishment. But man, doing that over and over and over again, it gets tiring. One thing that I think is a viable option is to cap the limit of entries and raise entry fees. I don't know if I can speak for everyone, but if a event was going to say, hey, instead of doing nearly 400 entries like we did last year and you guys were here for what seemed like months on end, we're going to raise entry fees by almost double and we're going to cap entries and our days are going to be a lot shorter and almost to the point where it's a full day shorter of a program. Maybe you only have to show up on Friday, practice Saturday, we run the whole thing on Sunday. Something along those lines. I personally, after years of doing this, would enjoy that format way more. That's something that I could do a little bit more. Doesn't require as much of a time commitment. I think that it would be a much better relationship for me with the hobby if it was that kind of racing environment. Now I understand worlds, nationals, Perhaps that's a little bit different scenario, so I'm going to leave some room for exception. But generally speaking, that's the type of change I would like to see to help alleviate the stress that I think a lot of people feel going to these big races all the time. As far as race formats go, I don't really know if you're going to get a big impact difference from the race format itself. Uh, ultimately, when it comes to branding RC, making it more appealing or changing people's opinions towards it. Um, maybe one thing that I thought was kind of fun, one of the local series here is adopting the, um, instead of the whole five minute session and qualifying, your best three laps, and then using that as the determining factor for the qualifying position for the main later, which I thought that was kind of fun because then it makes the qualifying and heat a little bit less stressful. You don't have to put the whole session together. So for like nitro racers, if you flame out, it's okay. Just fire it back up, go back out there, and you still have a shot at qualifying and it doesn't totally ruin your event. I personally haven't run it yet, but I, in theory, it sounds like a good idea as far as lowering the stress level from the early portions of the event. JQ, if you have any other ideas as far as race formats and things that would make a huge difference for race day enjoyment, then I'm all ears and I'd love to hear it. Race formats. I completely forgot. Good point. Thanks for the reminder. Okay, so race po formats is something we need to update. I think that the most important and the most problematic situation now is actually in the club racing and regional racing type of races, because that's where new people show up. They expect to have a lot of fun and then it's mainly just sort of waiting, 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 standing in line for practice and uh, waiting between heats and then racing against the clock a couple of times and then a short main because they'll be in a low main probably. So that's not really that much fun. So the best club racing format that I have come across, this works if you have sort of a two qualifiers in the main or three qualifiers in the main or something like that. What you do is, first of all, 
if practice is a problem where people are standing in line. Yeah, we're waiting in line. This is a 25 minute uh, line at the moment. Then definitely have sort of set practice times and you know, you change all the drivers on the stand to keep it moving. Or then even better, you know, you have practice heats like club racing, no need to do this. But if it's any kind of race with a bigger entry, definitely have heats ready. Make sure everyone practices in their heat. This is also a good time to check for any transponder issues and stuff that saves time in the qualifying rounds. Because in practice, it doesn't matter. You can just, you know, run through the heats. And if someone isn't counting, you figure that, that out in those heats. So, and also everyone gets the same amount of practice and they know when, when they're up. So it's, it's the best way. But yeah, the format, the racing format itself, first round of qualifying, make it so it's not the whole time. It's just three laps or four laps or five laps and any five laps in that five minute qualifier. So it's the best five laps, any five laps, and then the average time that is your qualifying time. And when you do this, it's good because the quality of your heat doesn't really matter if you have slower drivers in your heat and you're complaining because they kept you up or crashed in front of you or something. It doesn't matter because it's just five laps. Anyone can get five laps. So that's good. And also one qualifier like that is enough because after that, what you do is then you seed the drivers into races, qualifying races. So the fastest guys are, let's say you have... 10 drivers in the heat, top 10 in uh, the last heat, let's say it's heat five. So top 10 in heat five, then 11 to 20 in heat four. Uh, now it's getting, math is getting difficult now. So 21 to 30 in heat three and so on. And then they race each other. So the winner of the fastest heat, heat five, is TQ. If you break in that race, you last, you still qualify 10th overall. And then last place in the last heat, if it's full, is 50th. So that, that way you make already qualifying more fun, where you just have one round where you do the fast laps, then you're in a qualifying race, and then you're racing for your final qualifying position already. Then after that, you have your main, or bump up mains preferably. So even if you broke in, in the first qualifying round, you didn't get five laps, you're in a low race, you win your race, then you go into bump up mains. So then you can still bump up all the way. I think this format works the best for the smaller races because it's more heads up racing, more excitement, more fun races to watch. And then when we go to the other end of the spectrum, so we go to the big, bigger events, this goes for the big events like DNC or, um, you know, even bigger events like the World Championships. We need to make sure that we don't make the events themselves too long, like Ryan mentioned. I think 10 days for the World Championships is ridiculous. You cannot convince me that the people who decided this had the best interest of the races at mind. I guarantee you it was a decision made because it is nice to travel. Let's just put it that way. International Federation of Men Arranging Retreats. With a name like that, this is the reason. Now some people may argue, well, how much fun is it going to the RC track every day and it's probably in the middle of nowhere. Well, it's still traveling. You know, you go out at night, have a couple of beers, drinks, talk with friends in a foreign country. That's maybe also a reason why we tend to go to some quite exotic locations many times. You know, where the RC races are wondering, like, why are we here? What are we doing here? Why couldn't we go somewhere else? Well, you know, we've been to Sicily, supposed to be going to Brazil now. Just saying. Let's shorten up these events. There's no reason to have four days of practice or six days or whatever the hell they have. It's not going to change the results. If we had one day of practice or a week of practice, the same guys are going to be fast and the same guys are going to be slow. So what the hell is the reason? What is the point? No one that I know wants this. Not the racers, not the manufacturers, just IFMAR. It's ridiculous. 
I even wrote about this back in 2014. That's six years ago, seven years ago. Nothing has changed. Still having like a fucking month long world championships. It's ridiculous. It needs to stop. Euros are too long also. We don't need Euros, six day Euros. No, Euros could easily be four days, even three days. But let's just make it four. So come on, we need to shorten the length of these events. Okay, so finally we have the biggest races, the professional races. So we have the World Championships, European Championships, the RCGP World Series. So this is for both the professional races, but also people who have this as a hobby. Uh, but not everyone can go. So you have to sort of qualify through your country and then you can go. Well, except RC2 and RCGP, then basically anyone can go. These races, in my opinion, they really have to promote the RC industry because they are setting themselves up as the premier events of the industry. So they have to look the part, the track preparation, the banners, the pits, everything needs to be the best it possibly can, including the coverage. So you can't just have a static camera in the corner and call yourself uh, some kind of big championship. You know, you have to invest the money to make sure that you have good race coverage. So pictures, video, information on social media, on websites, to cover the event in a way that people who aren't there can follow. Also, the facility itself needs to be good. So the people who attend, they have uh, nice pits, cleaning facilities for the cars, everything, you know, covered pits goes without saying. Like these races, they have to go that extra mile. They are setting the bar for other races to follow. So back in the day, it was enough to just lay out some cones in a field and some rope maybe and put up a loop and, and build a you know makeshift driver's stand and that was it and people were charging their cars you know from their real car batteries and pitting in the boot of their car or on a small table or whatever right that's truly nerds in a field now we are moving on and trying to be more professional and we want to look the part. We want to be something that people look at and are amazed and think, wow, that's insane that people are doing this professionally and internationally. Wow, I'm going to give this a try. We want to look attractive and exciting and professional. So these are the races that need to do that. They have the income to be able to do this. So they should do it. If not, we shouldn't attend. Vote with your wallet. Earlier, I said that tracks need to be profitable. Well, one problem that I see today, and this especially happens now in America again, is that there are these big races, so mega entry events, four day events, three, four, five day events uh, with, you know, 500 to 1000 entries. So a good chunk of money coming in 50 to $80,000 just in entries, not even sponsorship coming in. So what do they do? They host these races at tracks they build for that event. First, you just think, okay, well, so what? What's the big deal? Well, the problem is that these regions have tracks, existing tracks. So it would be a lot better if these big races visited existing permanent tracks to help fund them to make sure that they don't go away because what good is it if a region only has one big race a year on a track that's specifically built for that big event that's no good so we don't want the local tracks to die so where possible these big events should use the established permanent tracks to help fund them you know that could be their one big event a year and they have you know some income from that race definitely but also before the race people will want to go there for a warm-up race or just club racing during the week weeks before or go there to practice more so a big race like that really helps a track with business not only during the event itself uh, and whatever the sort of race organizer and the track can agree on as payment but and of course, if there's a hobby shop there and then sales during the race, 
but also in the weeks before, maybe even months before, there will be more people going to that track just to practice and club race because they are preparing for the big event. So I think it's a big mistake when these professional race organizers go in and sort of short-sightedly, I would say selfishly, decide that they will do everything. They will build the track, put on the event, and then yes, they, they do have to pay for the venue and stuff, but then they don't have to deal with the track owners and that stuff. I think really more effort should be made to work with uh, permanent tracks. Because let's face it, the tracks are the lifeblood of this industry. If the tracks go away, like I said in the first video, you don't have a track, the hobby is dead for you. There's no racing. Okay, so that's it for today. Hopefully you find this video helpful. Hopefully you find some, maybe some ideas that you can implement in your own race organizing if you're a guy that runs a track. And this is what we'll be talking about next week in the final part of this three-part series on the RC industry. We're going to talk about federations, the problems with them today, and how they could solve those problems and by solving them help our industry. So until next time, I guess. See ya.